Hello, how are you doing? Fine, I'm not sure what the discussion is today. It, uh, it was billed as open. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, the less preparation, the better. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> I, I arrived from my other seminar, so, although it was an open one today, too, so. Yeah. How many, uh, how many cl- hours do you have to, to teach a week? How many semester hours? I wonder? It's not so bad. I only have, um, in the fall, I have um, six hours a week. Uh-huh. Uh, but in the winter, I'm not actually teaching any courses. What I'm doing is I'm running, well, I'm participating in one seminar and running another seminar, uh-huh. four hours out of the week. So it's not so Oh, bad. okay. All right. All right. All right. <clears throat> I'm not uh, very familiar. You, you're in Quebec, right? You're, yeah. yeah. It's, is it is the uh, university system there different than like in the rest of Canada? Since I mean, they do use French, but is it structured it, similarly? It, it is. It has its own peculiarities. Peculiarities. It's all unionized in Quebec, uh-huh. which is unusual in universities in general. In yeah. Canada, I don't know about the United States. Uh, so, um, mm-hmm. so, and there's some, you know, Quebec has a particular way of doing things. And yes, yes, uh, that's why I was interested. Yeah, that's true about all the universities here, with the possible exception of McGill, which is a very Anglo university, but the others, which tend to be more francophone, have a different flavor and structure. Mm-hmm. McGill is in Quebec. It's in Montreal, but it's... Uh... Oh, okay, okay. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I, I worked with a guy for a while who had, had gone to McGill. He had done his bachelor's and PhD there and whatnot. Yeah. But it was very, that was very... He, he, he was also a, a French speaker, but he... Um, from what I had gathered in our interaction and whatnot, it seemed to be, like you had said, a little more oriented towards the English system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think about, I think 40 or 50 or even 60% of McGill is still Francophone. Oh, really? A major Anglophone. And it is known as an English university. Rather. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Ah, well, our fearful organizer is... <laughs> <laughs> You can't say you know you can't say dropped in in the virtual world, can you? <laughs> you just kind of appear. Yeah, yeah it's just <laughs> they drop up, don't they? <laughs> yes, they pop up. Yes, they pop up. <laughs> there's some pop ups you like, and there's other ones you go, oh, "What the hell is that about?" Yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe we need a new language for these things. Yeah, uh, a new set of vocabulary wouldn't hurt. That's for sure. <laughs> Although, given the way the speed at which things change, it'll only be good for two years anyway. So. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> if, if that long, yeah. <laughs> hey, I have this crazy idea. I'm, I'm, I sort of think I should wait until everybody comes on before I, I don't know, but I'll share it with you guys anyway. <laughs> if, you, if you've got something good to spring on us, Jeffrey, I, I would suggest that you, <laughs> that you wait to do it till we all can... All right, all right. <laughs> can savor the weirdness that you like to just spread around. I, I I really enjoyed the a little vignette about your brothers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are a bit of an eclectic bunch. <laughs> no, yeah, but you but you got you got this strain of weirdness about you that I and I think is very admirable. I have uh, I have uh, a couple of younger brothers. One of them was a, a colonel in the in the Air Force, and the other one was a lifelong civil servant in the Department of Agriculture. So, they they had those very traditional, I, I guess, if you will, you know, kind of careers. And and I've never been anywhere for any length of time. That my brother's yeah. stories are even more complicated than what I put up because the brother who's a mathematician, yes, his first degree was in anthropology. Oh, okay. So he's also a bit of a mixed kettle. And then okay, I, that's good. Who's an electrical engineer, started yeah. his, his, his professional life as an auto mechanic, 
and then became a Tai Chi expert oh. and then went to electrical engineering. So none of them well, have a, a normal... Well, that, that's a real logical progression. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Très <laughs> bon. <laughs> so... That's a good mix. Hmm. Day. Hey. Evening. There he is. Howdy, mindful. <laughs> How do you do? I. <laughs> <laughs> How are our minds today? Mine's a bit sleepy because I didn't. I only got five hours sleep, and I had to get up to run a seminar. So. I did okay oh. the seminar, so I'm. I should be all right. Yeah. I have a nap afterwards. What's yeah. the seminar on? What was your seminar on? Oh, it's my re- augmented reality one. Uh, so we would, and we're talking about making ethical augmented reality applications. It's quite an interesting project. So. Mm-hmm. So we came up with a project to do. Uh, I wanted to get the students and the people who participate, I wanted to get them to do some real hands-on programming with mm-hmm. augmented reality, but I wanted us to include ethical considerations into the project. And we brainstormed up a project stay at Super. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> What kind of applications are you talking about? So the one we're talking about that we're developing is, or we're looking at developing is, um, so in the university here, um, there's a, an underground system of tunnels that connects all the buildings that's used heavily in the winter when the snow is high and also by people with disabilities in order to get around between the different buildings. But it's a dark place. It's You can get disoriented down there and, you know, there are issues. So, But there are graffiti on the walls. And so the idea is to use an augmented reality application which focuses on the graffiti on the walls which we can pick up and and um, each piece of graffiti ties it spatially down to that location and so we can use the graffiti to develop our spatial reference system Mm -hmm. and then help people with with handicap with disability whether they're in a wheelchair to find the access and entrance points if there are visual deficits to help them locate themselves where they are in the, in the tunnels, things like that. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, so you depend on the graffiti not being cleaned up. Exactly. And mm-hmm. so we're going to have some discussions with the, well, the graffiti is, they're off, they're very artistic. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and they're, and like different classes at different times will go down and do a new graffiti. And uh. it, and they're kept because they're part of the underground decor, if you like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We can use them as to, uh, a reference points. So anyway, it's a cool project. Mm-hmm. But, uh, mm-hmm. Yes. And it sounds like it. I have to run. Like my, my kettle's about to boil. No, I don't so, want that to overcook. <laughs> so, so would one be walking through this labyrinth between buildings underground? wearing some sort of glasses, contact lenses, other devices that would be projecting or basically envir- aware of its environment, aware of, its, of the user's exactly. location. Exactly, like a smartphone. Mm-hmm. Good job. But it could be glasses, right? It could, it could be, be contact lenses. And the interesting thing is, is underground, so there's no signal. It's hard to get a signal. Mm. But that's why we're using the graffiti to do the spatial referencing rather than because there's no... There's no you know, the app will work, the, 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 uh, the smartphone will work, but it won't get a signal. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So the map is downloaded into the device. Yes. It's local to the user. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yes. Brave new world. Follow the anarchist A in order to get to the archaeology <laughs> department. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a, that's a, really, uh, that's a really nice uh, little project, actually. 
It, it's because um, we needed something that isn't too technolo technologically um, difficult because um, we only have some beginner program. We have some expert programs, but we have some beginner programmers and people who don't know anything about AI and other people who know a lot, uh, uh, AR, but other people who know a lot. It's mm -hmm. a mix of things. So we needed something that's doable. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. Sounds like it would be, yes. It's one of those things where you don't want the least common denominator, you want actually the greatest common denominator. Collective in, in yes. the group, and yeah. we got it today. It was fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. Hi, Zach. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. So. Ooh. Now that everybody's here, I wanted to just throw something out. It's another crazy idea that I have. Um, and we don't have to do it today. Uh, I guess Johnny's missing. Is Johnny coming today? He's not coming, right? No, he excused himself today. Okay. So I kind of wanted to include him, but he'll see the video, right? So the, I'm the sure. question was, when I look at you guys' faces, I see stuff in the background. And I'm curious about what's in the background. Mm -hmm. Like... Like the other day with the writers group, Zach, you had these really interesting spirally things in the background on the one side and what looked like a nebula on a calendar on the, on the other side. And Marco, you've got these really interesting Great. poster things behind. And mm -hmm. I remember Johnny had a little statue behind him that I could see. Anyway, I'm really curious about the, the environments that you live and work in and something about the, I thought we could share some of that, you know, about what the backgrounds are. Anyway. Backra background information. No, you're, you're, you're. Physically. You're physically. Yes. You're physically. Yes. It yes. Comes the body, but it's the body in the sense of. Literally. Like, background information. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, maybe we should start with the, the Zen backgrounds. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> With the, <laughs> there's two, there's, there's two here that are completely zen. I agree with you, Marco. <laughs> Doug, I mean, uh, the other day you were in a what looked like a library or something. It looked like there were some very interesting things going on in the background there too. You know, so oh, we don't hear you. You're not muted, and we don't hear you. I can jump in. Before we okay. Uh, well, Wait, let's make sure we get a connection with him and he, he like, uh, actually figures out his issue. Chat it up. You want to do the preferences? Audio preferences? All right. Well, in that case. <laughs> oh, he's going to come back on, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can say quickly that... Um, I wasn't in my office. I have a new office coming, so I'll have a new background with a few things, which I kind of <laughs> not where you saw in this interview I did a couple of days ago. But um, I was in the office of the doctor who runs the clinic, and he has he does have these very nice. I mean, it's kind of like the chakra system. There's these little tiny pictures from red, essentially to violet, and uh, they're very small and very elegant. And uh, just every he hasn't every he's not here all the time. And as I've been doing my office. Um, because it's not finished, I'll just I'll use his because it's super nice. So that's <laughs> kind of what what you saw. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, I, as a young child, I grew up with this idea in school. You probably had something like this. You used to call it show and tell. Mm -hmm. And the idea was you brought in a little object or something from your home environment school and you explained it to everybody else. And it was this idea of connecting out people's lives with the school environment. So I've done these show and tell activities my whole life. I've done them with everybody. Because <laughs> I think it's really interesting to sort of connect up the world. So this is part of a show and tell kind of thing, activity that I'm talking about. Hmm. <laughs> Are you able to hear me at this point? Yep. Yeah. 
All right. Congrats. I was wondering, I, I know I mentioned we could talk over each other, but I, I kept saying many, many different things and nobody responded. So <laughs> I thought it was just a... <laughs> It not acknowledging funny. me, but that makes sense. All right. But um, I guess, obviously, I have the Zen background. Um, yeah. I wanted to add something earlier to what you said, Jeffrey, about the graffiti. But I, I don't know if they're actual murals. Yeah, they're murals. Yeah. So if, if they ever do disappear, um, I know there was just a, a New York judge that had, there was like a $7 million lawsuit for graffiti artists that had murals. So if they ever do disappear, it sounds like they're permanent. And so if somebody does remove it, it would have to be go yeah, through some sort of legal. And we are thinking about intellectual property issues because there are intellectual property issues for graffiti. So we're going to have to check with the associations that put up the the uh, the murals to make sure that we can use them this way. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that was just here in... Uh, at least the story was from Lexington. It might have been, it was a New York judge, so it was probably in New York where it, the actual incident occurred. But. So I, well, I think when you were out, uh, Doug, I was saying the other day you had a library background or something that, that we were looking at. And it looked, it looked like there was, that, was activity going on behind somewhere. Was that a, a night call during like a writer's group? Or? Yeah, the writer's group, yeah. That's... That's my only bookshelf in the house. I, I res we have a small house, so I, I finally, I guess the previous owners, we just moved in this house a couple of years ago, and they had it as a DVD shelf. So it was my first manly indoor project was to change it from DVD level to book level on the shelves. And so I, I've replaced it with books. But um, yeah, my, my parents just moved out of their house in Tennessee. So all my boxes of random junk that I didn't want to carry around everywhere um, will be coming up to me next time I visit there for uh, the Big Ears Festival in the middle of March. So I'll have, I'll have some more books that I'll just put in storage because I don't have any room for them right now. We also have her, uh, Rain, my wife's parents, will be coming to live with us once uh, they go through all the rigmarole for the paperwork and processing immigration and all that good stuff but so uh, we'll have a, a packed house which I'm, well, for someone like me it'll it'll be a, a challenge and a, a blessing I'll, I'll be relieved of my child care duty um from the time i get home until the time he goes to bed uh, we also have a, a second child on the way in may so that's it's going to be quite a quite a packed house but I'll enjoy it. I like the community aspect. Maybe that's why I'm exploring community in general, so I can get used to it. But, um, yeah. It's definitely good to have help. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm yeah, especially looking forward to it. I have stories about everything in this, in this room, Jeffrey, and even the room itself. I, I don't know if I should get into it. Um, like, uh, yeah, start with the maybe. start with the brains, maybe. Okay, maybe I'll just start there, and I'll just tell the little a little story there. Maybe another time I could tell about that um, painting. It's not a painting; the print. Uh, there's a tanka, on my bookshelf. But so there was a obviously that's inspired by the Obama uh, posters of the of the time, 2008. But it's a it's a copy of a poster that I saw uh, in a bookstore that used to exist downtown about five blocks from where I live. And it was called Brain Food, uh, a bookstore. And it was focused on local authors. It only sold books by Colorado-based uh, authors. And it was a young uh, couple that had started it in this building that was sort of like subdivided up into like a little inside indoor mall uh, and, you know, with jewelers and hairstylists and uh, cake makers and things like that in there. But uh, they were young uh, and starting a bookstore by themselves and they were struggling. Uh, and at, at one point, uh, unbeknownst to me, I didn't learn until later, they became homeless. Uh, and they also had a child uh, and were living out of a, a camper van uh, in Longmont in the Walmart parking lot. And I used to go down there and strike up conversation and uh, we've held a book club there once uh, for 
the book Infinite Jest by, by Wallace, David Foster Wallace. Uh, we did a local meetup at their bookstore. And, uh, and the, they were both writers as well, the, the proprietors. So anyway, they had the brains poster there and I, I liked it. And so I looked it up and uh, I wanted to have something kind of uh, fun like that in, in my room. And yeah. I couldn't tell you who the, who the artist is either. It's probably written somewhere on there. And what about the room, Marco? We are in your house here? This is actually a separate structure from the house. We have a small uh, two-bedroom house, and it's about 1,000 square feet, maybe actually 950 or so. And then when we had our daughter, I didn't have a place to really work. Uh, and um, I had this dream of having a separate, having my own studio, uh, having my own incubation space. And so we found a um, company that sells uh, pre, kind of prefabricated sheds that can be turned into uh, living spaces. And so this is really, a, it's a, called a studio shed. Uh, and it's sort of this modern structure that w was assembled. And then with a, a friend in the neighborhood, we did the interior of it. Uh, he was a construction you know, professional and he helped out with the walls and everything, all this stuff that I am not manly enough <laughs> to do. Um, and, uh, but I helped out uh, and learned a lot and uh, you know, poured the floor, exactly. did a whole bunch of work on, on, on this space. I mean, poured a whole summer and then some, dug the foundations down, you know, three, f six feet down through uh, clay soil. Uh, you know, it was obviously a big investment of, of money as well. I mean, a lot less than remodeling the house or uh, even paying for an office, it came out to cost less than having a separate office in, in town. But it's been, my, uh, it's been my incubation space now for the last six years. And I, I really was taking a, a sort of bet on myself like, that I could produce something in this space. That if I gave myself a space, a room of my own, uh, I would be able to bring something forth uh, that I was struggling to in the house and, you know, in the context of domestic life and obligations and a new marriage and uh, you know, the life of a freelancer, etc. Uh, so this, this is kind of my, my pod, uh, if you will, for, uh, you know, cosmic uh, enterprises. <laughs> wow. It's cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to actually just throw something out there as, as I am kind of decorating this new office. If, if anyone has any good ideas for um, meta maps, uh, please let me know. Uh, future John, this is also a question for you. If you have any ideas for good, good meta maps that might look cool in the office, you know, I was thinking of like, I've got some spiral dynamics some integral. Um, the doctors developed some of his own meta maps. So if anyone comes out with something that kind of might look nice on a wall, let me know, and, uh, are and it might make a cut. Are you talking to future John there? Yeah, future John. My future mm -hmm. John. But he had that one with the subliminal self and the superliminal self and this mm -hmm. sort of kind of toroidal uh, structure that I thought was pretty cool. I didn't get a good look at it. He, he held it up, and I didn't, I didn't follow up with it. Ed's John. You, you look like you're in your library, Ed. Um, I'm in what's called my, my office or my study, if you will. It's, uh, I, li I live in the same house with my, uh, daughter and son-in-law and grandson. And we're on what's, what would be considered the ground floor. And it's a, a three bedroom apartment. Uh, that's where his mother used to live. And my, my son-in-law and daughter, they live upstairs. They have a, uh, the upstairs is all built and downstairs is also another small apartment with uh, one bedroom, kitchen, living room and in uh, bath. Um, used to be a guy that lives down there. He was the best man at my uh, son-in-law's and daughter's wedding, but he's moved in with his girlfriend in the meantime. And so it's now where we put up guests when they come for any period of time. It's down in the basement. And this is the second smallest room. It's about 12 square meters. You guys can do all the conversions if he wants to. 
Um, I have I have books on all on three of the walls. There's, to my left here, there's a window. I have a couple of file cabinets, and up behind me, you can see a couple of uh, certificates and a picture that's hanging there on the wall. That's my my wall of irony, uh, if you will. There's a Army Commendation Medal uh, hanging up there. There's a certificate of appreciation from the Federal Border Police from my time on the border uh, during the Cold War when I was stationed here. Um, and there's my certificate of appointment as a member of the International Research Council for the uh, Rosicrucian Order. And on up here on the wall beside me are all my degrees and diplomas that are hanging up there. Um, I, I literally papered the wall. It's the wall of sarcasm that I like to call it. <laughs> and behind me, it's basically a general reference in philosophy, and then the, the library goes off around this way, around the wall. It's all ordered according to the Dewey Decimal System. Unlike my daughter, who has labeled all of her books with numbers, uh, mine are just in this general order so that we can find things. And this is where I spend most of my time. If I look out here, there's a window right off to my left. I can look out over the, the front yard across the road and a, a couple of fields. Um, and I can see the, the giant windmills on the top of the hills uh, to the left because we're all into alternative energy here in, in Germany. So you got to have windmills <laughs> wherever it is that you go. But this is where I spend my time for the most part. And this is where I get sent when I misbehave. And <laughs> everybody gets sent to their room. This is my room. Dog house. Also, sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and the, is there room for the wall of the curmudgeon? Is that the ceiling or is that all the online? No, no. The, there's, a, there's a general atmosphere of curmudgeonry that, uh, <laughs> that, that permeates the space. I, I, you know, one has to cultivate it somewhere. And uh, maybe there's I, some I, kind I, of mister, like a curmudgeon mist that. <laughs> well, <laughs> so they diffuse through the room. Well, yeah, there's an there's an aura that's that, that's here. I mean, I, I do have to. Well, we do have a, a a covered deck in the in the back, which is rather large. We can uh, when my when my grandson was uh, baptized, we had 18 people out there on the at a table for coffee and cake, and we have a small one out in the front where I can watch you know cars go by and um, be facetious about all the people who are traveling places and going. Them. So, but uh, so, so I, you know, it's. Uh, yeah. I find it interesting that you only you get sent to your room when you misbehave because I only get to come to my room and do what I want when I behave really well. It's like it's well, you see, it's it's the, the, that's the whole thing. The, the paradox is when others don't want me around, they send me here. <laughs> so if I. I get to go out when I, you know, it's time to do the dishes. I do most of the cooking around here these days. I, uh, I do all of the uh, holiday meals, for example. Uh, we have a very regimented plan. We all eat communal meals so that when it's, it's, it's a kind of an odd situation because my, my son-in-law works in uh, uh, building construction. So he's, he's off. He's out and about most of, the, most of the time. He actually works down in Frankfurt, which is about an hour and a half from here. So he's not here four days a week. He only comes, he leaves early Friday morning about five o'clock and comes back in the, on Thursday afternoon. And my daughter works at the university down in Hohenheim, which is near Stuttgart. And she's gone from Tuesdays through Thursday as well. So in that middle time, and Doug can appreciate this, we're the ones that, that fill the gap for the, you know, taking care of the little one. So he's with us those three days of the week. So, there's a lot for me to do elsewhere here in the house. <laughs> I don't get to spend as much time here as I'd like. And I do appreciate it when I get sent here for, you know, just go off and do your thing and wherever you are. So um, those times I, I enjoy, but more often than not, I get pulled out of here than sent here. Were you being facetious about the Dewey Decimal System? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not. My my daughter has my my. I can't remember there. She has a a necklace that says, "It's like three fourteen point forty two, I believe." 
<laughs> and that's that's where you find fairy tales in the duets. <laughs> yeah. So no, she got that from me. <laughs> but but mine is different in that mine goes from right to left, not from left to right. I think so I know who to nominate. I think I know who to nominate for our archivist. <laughs> so you have to be able to find things, you know, and, and, and I learned to appreciate the Dewey. I have to say this. I, have to, I, I learned to appreciate the Dewey Decimal System when I came to Germany and went to a German university. Because at the University of Gießen, every institute had its own library. And every institute has its own systematic of organizing books. And it was different from the one that was used at the university as a whole. And the one that was used at the university as a whole is different than the, the systematics that are used at any other university in Germany. So wherever you go, you kind of have to like learn a new map. And, and the brilliant thing, it's underestimated and overlooked, is that in the United States, every single library is organized the same way. You walk in and you kind of know where you need to go, even if you use the card catalog or otherwise. And you don't have that here. This is absolute chaos in the German university system. And even in public, uh, uh, you know, there's a library no, up here in Biden. Are you telling me no German came up with a universal indexing system for all knowledge? I'm sure that more than one did. <laughs> <laughs> and therein lies the rub, getting <laughs> Germans to agree <laughs> on, you know, it, is it Kant? Is it Hegel? Is it Sloterdijk? Is it Nietzsche? Who is it? You say. <laughs> <laughs> and so, no, that, that underlying, uh -uh, didn't manage to man and get that one put together. So. Well, just to note, since one of the themes that came up in the discussion thread or Doug that you posted in relation to today's talk as an open conversation and the theme of slow thought. I, I, I'm remembering now that I'm probably part of the last generation that used a card catalog in school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, I mean, you, you would, you'd look it up <laughs> and you pull out the long drawers, <laughs> and flip through, see if they had it there. That was my first volunteering job was, um, I think I was 11, and I would organize the, the files or the index cards, like you said. And that was a pleasure for me, so I can be Ed's assistant for the archivist. <laughs> well, let me, ask, let me ask this into the group. How many of you are Virgos, Sunshine, and how many of you have Virgo Rising? You know, you don't even know, guys. Do you, huh? So, okay. Well. well, I know, but it's not that. <laughs> it's not that. Okay. Well, you're also not the one that chimed in and said, "Oh, yes, the Dewey Decimal System is the way we have to go." <laughs> you're right. I'm not the one who chimed in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I you would have been the last person I expected it from. But, <laughs> but Jeff, you have a pretty indexed uh, Goodreads. Um, I, not that I went and browsed everything, but you seem to have your, your Goodreads books. That could be the modern day version of the, the Dewey Decimal System. I, I like lists and Goodreads is essentially the site for super big lists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I like lists and I like that because I think I mentioned somewhere that I'm a bit chaotic in my life structure and everything. So it, it's why I'm, I think I'm at the, I was trying to, exchange with Marco and, and we were talking about the role of editing and an editor is not a good role for me because you have to be systematic and follow through with everybody and I'm not good at, with that kind of stuff. Mm. I like to do things in bursts and then I have downtime between them, you know. You can still reorganize things that way but you have to be do it slightly differently. So managing people is not great because people, if you're managing people, downtime doesn't work. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey's not a cat herder. <laughs> organizing thing, I can do that, but I can do that provided I can do it in bits and not mm. sustained. You know, so. Mm. 
Yeah, I can relate to cat herding. But <laughs> <laughs> you can. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'm not a cat person either. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's funny how people end up in certain roles in their lives. <laughs> but this thing about uh, libraries, I used to spend hours in the. Li- I mean, I was a student at the time, but I used to spend I used to go into the library in the morning and come out at night, like eleven o'clock at night, and go, "Where did the day go?" You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that anymore i haven't been in a library that way for years one of the few, one of the few jobs in my life that i actually enjoyed and i've had many believe me was uh was during my time of my undergraduate work and i got a part-time job as a bookshelver in the university library um I didn't last very long because I ended up reading more than I put back on the shelves. Um, so my productivity was, <laughs> was rather low. But um, that, that was a really, a really nice job because I would get this cart of books and have to put them back so that people would find them again. Because back in those days, if you wanted to reserve a book, you simply moved it to the shelf above, below, or a couple of uh, volumes down. And people would go to look at the Dewey Decimal System, and it wouldn't be there, and they would figure, oh, it's not here. Mm-hmm. And that was the best way to lose a book in, in plain sight, so to speak. So those, those of us who were more adept at, at the inner workings of the library, we knew where people were hiding stuff because it was never too far away. <laughs> College students tend to be lazy. They're not going to walk over to the next uh, stack. You know, so they'll, <laughs> so they'll do it somewhere local. But, um, but I really enjoyed that because, uh, and it's, it's odd that fairy tales came up because I, I always packed up my book with uh, my, my, my cart with children's literature for the elementary education uh, department. Because I always like to see, well, how are we brainwashing our children these days? This was in the, in the late 60s when I was going to university. So uh, we, had, we had different mindsets then. Uh, than perhaps later. And so I spent a lot of time reading children's literature and that was the, that was probably the biggest part of my education at the university. So I loved that job. <laughs> I used to love that our university had the library open 24 hours. Oh, um, really? Yeah, we were, I was there two in the morning. Sometimes I slept there. Oh, really? Uh, mm-hmm. Or, you know, it may have only been during certain times. I may take that back. There were some buildings that you could get into uh, okay. 24, like the engineering building. It was this really interesting architect, architectural oh, building with all these nooks and crannies. And you'd find these little places to, you know, to camp out and study. Um, yeah. Well, I can tell you where I went. Nothing was open all night mm-hmm. except for... <laughs> except for a rest- a truck stop about 20 miles outside of town. <laughs> That's where you could meet up with people at the, in the middle of the night. It wasn't at the library. I can tell you that. <laughs> Even our engineering building wasn't open 24 hours a day. Uh, that, that thought was unthinkable. in 1957. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, for Three us yeah, at, at our school, I mean, the idea was, you know, you, know, you had yeah. to be working your ass off. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. the library had to be open because, you know, God damn it, people needed to study. But of course, it was a smaller percentage that was actually making use of you know, the facilities at that time. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. It just had a smell to it, though, right? And it had these yeah. rows yeah. and the smell to it is what I remember yeah. from the library. And I went to Binghamton University oh. in New York, by the way. It was uh, from the public uh, state schools. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, I'm just, it's just bringing back some memories. That's all. Mm-hmm. This is open time and yeah, yeah, we're it is. Yeah. 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 I was just looking at the Dewey system. I, I didn't know it at all. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I saw, so I'm just looking down at it. Zero, zero, zero general knowledge, you know, a hundred yes. psychology yes. and philosophy. There's, there's a very intrinsic suggestion of hierarchy here, which to be honest, I, 
I kind of kind of admire and kind of appreciate. I mean, you got general knowledge first, <laughs> then you got psychology and philosophy like right at the top, like right yeah, there. Then, <laughs> then religion and mythology, which I and I, I actually agree with the whole thing. And then social yeah. sciences, and math and science gets like down there, medicine and technology, arts and recreation. But then my big question is, like right before the last one, which is geography and history, you got literature, and I'm like, okay, so that's the only one I'm I'm not quite with, but. <laughs> the rest looks good. <laughs> <laughs> you always save the best to last till you realize there's something left over. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's, That's like something it. for a future TJ there to, <laughs> to mull over. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, he's right at the end of the. He's right at the end. Well, that, yeah, it's. <laughs> I'm sure he'll have a, a nice, healthy comment about that. <laughs> no doubt. No, I love Dewey. I, I, I think he's uh, he's great. Keeps me organized. So, Marco, if I can, or this is to everybody, but if we can steer the conversation to kind of focus on your the what is that? that you just posted recently that you and Jeffrey have kind of gone back and forth the playbook. There we go. Hmm. Like that's, that's a very interesting concept and uh, I don't want you to have to tell all about it now or you probably threw it out there so you don't have to think about it for a while, but uh, just uh, I, I, I like it. And I don't know if it's been mentioned before in previous conversations as to how, how you have planned for this to come about, but uh, it's, it's very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, I, I wasn't going to talk about it. I could talk about it, seriously. Like, I could go on and on about it, and I, I don't want to impose that upon the sort of open frame of the conversation. Uh, but... I'm happy to share it. I'm happy to try to be succinct, I guess. Uh, if, if, if there's also a sense of like, what else is in the space? What else kind of, you know, like I know you're working on the elder, uh, elder uh, uh, care project, right? And they had some exchange with Jeffrey about a care and nurturing kind of committee that you've experienced through mm -hmm. Quaker uh, meetings or Quaker groups. Um, there's a lot. There's a number of things in the space, is, is I guess what I'm what I what I mean. There's, we've talked about Taylor de Chardin a little bit. There's books. There's some things coming up, like kind of bubbling up there about uh, the, the time thing and how much can we take on. You know, like how much more can we read, uh, and how do we sort of manage the different streams of information, the different streams of conversation, and the different projects. And I mean, the, I guess the reason. I want to make sure that we just presence those things is because part of the motivation, even for a playbook kind of project or like what that, what the need that that is meeting, I think is to kind of wrangle all this stuff a little bit and sort of write, be able to put down and write down in a public space, like how we're doing all these different things and how they all connect uh, or how they could connect that's one that would be one aspect of this this playbook idea but it kind of like came to me through through john actually um and the, his habit of reviewing videotapes it reminded me of like what football teams do or baseball teams do <laughs> which is that they watch their practices they, they tape their sessions they watch their practices they talk about it and then they have a playbook which has the plays that they you know are going to uh, in the formations, if it's a football team or like how they will bat against a certain pitcher, if it's a baseball team, et cetera. So, so there's that association with the idea. And I wrote it down somewhere a, a while ago. Um, but then there's also the association of, uh, like a theater company and the playbook being the, um, you know, what you need to know to perform in, in, in the production, uh, so the characters, the setting, et cetera. Um, and of course the other associations of play and 
um, uh, that, that sort of free spirit of interaction be- for the sake of it, because it has inherent intrinsic enjoyment and because it's intrinsically part of the good, you know, good life. Uh, and that gets back to your, your piece that you shared on slow thought and that play being one aspect of slow thought. So then where it came to kind of like, let's actually, what actually could that be? And why don't we work on it? Is that Caroline has been developing all this documentation around what the cooperative structure is, what the processes are, protocols, like the real systematic view with like her own sense of logic of how it, how it all connects, which a lot of, you know, a lot of it, I, uh, I agree with, you know, stuff that we've talked through and then she's, you know, interpreted it through into the, into a, a particular form, but it's not exactly a form that gives kind of easy access to participation in the sense that like, you can just pick it up and in a minute, like learn how to do something. Mm-hmm. It's more a theoretical kind of justification or grounding for the Organ, you know, for the model of what it's, it's is. the the rule book as opposed to the playbook, maybe that's <laughs> yeah, that's a fair char- I think characterization, and so they're they're entwined, um, but the playbook is meant to be like the real practical stuff, and like the templates, the the roles, uh, the how to, uh, and then from there. It's like, well, what's, where is the line between what's practical, like on a technical sense, and what's practical in the more of the interior arts of conducting the kinds of activities that we are, uh, producing conversations like this, uh, publishing uh, original writing, uh, creating other kinds of media, and so forth. These are all activities that you know, we're bringing different kinds of skills to and different set and ways of doing, but if we could learn from how we, we do all those things and then make those methods and those um, approaches available to a wider community, then we could kind of do it better. And uh, also enable somebody new coming in to quickly kind of get up this up to speed without this sort of confusion of how do you, you know, record a video conference or whatever. And, and the, the, the interior parts though, is really like stuff like that we learn just from doing like, I didn't know, for example, that uh, really a conversation needs a sort of like critical mass of people. It needs not too many, not too, not too few to have this kind of a conversation. And something like five people or six people works out really well. But I've had, we've had events with 20 or you know, up to 20 people or 10 or, or more, and there's a whole different dynamic. So how do we document like how these things could be crafted? so that we have these sort of templates for, for ways of approaching a dialogue, ways of structuring it, uh, how to conduct sort of the flow of different energies and different perspectives and different intentions. A lot of this has come out through things that John has worked on for, um, you know, through these cafes and other talks where he'll sort of ground us in a question like, what would you like to have happen? Or, um, you know, for this to be useful to you, it, it will be like what? Uh, and that's kind of been assimilated a little bit, I think, by, by everybody to a certain extent. So he doesn't have to as much like go through the, you know, the, the script of, of clean language. But that it would be that kind of thing that could be in a playbook and that could be really sourced from the community. Anybody who's participating may have something that they could add as a sort of tip or... Um, insight uh or a pointer something to think about something to contemplate like all that could just we can just throw that all in and give it some organization so that the you know the the stuff that comes first is going to be the you know the stuff you really need to essentially know to get you started but then the further you dig into it um or return to it you may find these you know really useful gems of wisdom or, or knowledge um that are really not just sourced in the community, but really in service to it. So that really we know we're on the same page in some sense. Uh, and I, I uh, you know, I, it, I'm sort of like Jeffrey a little bit in, in the sense that I, 
I think I appreciate and enjoy the orderliness and the, of something like a Dewey Decimal System. But in reality, the way that you know my books are and my papers and everything else is arranged is somewhat chaotic. It, it's not, you know, I don't have I don't have the exact order, and it, it's easier to for me to to get it good enough that I feel like ah, I'm just going to put I'm going to put it out. And it will start to take shape as people look at it and respond to it. And as I feel, you know, embarrassed about like its verbosity in certain ways and, uh, you know, like bring greater clarity to it. So I kind of see it as like the, yeah, the how we do what we do together. That's how Caroline put it, actually. Yeah, that's great. So I really like the playbook I, I hadn't quite caught that um I, I do remember seeing some reference to football somewhere but i i didn't quite understand what was going on there so i anyway so i think it was maybe a a discussion with carolyn on another topic but uh I, so I, the playbook didn't quite come through you know I, I don't know what i thought it was but i think it, anyway what it rem makes me think of though is so among my many activities, I've also done a, a, a bit of fashion work, work in fashion. And in, fa in the fashion industry, you have these things called lookbooks. So what is a lookbook? Is it, it's, it's a presentation of the designs that are ongoing for, a year, for the current year that you can present to somebody and so, as a showcase of what your design label is producing in terms of so it's usually a glossy document with mm -hmm. uh you know very nice images and you just flip through the images to get a sense of what the what the clothing line is about and uh, but what i'm thinking of is that the that the readings we're doing and the way we have so we have these these group discussions around the readings and those form a kind of a package that is kind of, and it might be interesting. So, um, you know, I, on one of the discussions, we were talking about this idea of identifying what are the different readings we're doing and how they fit, which are the group ones and which are the individual ones and which are ones that are just referenced, but don't actually come in a, in a more full way into the discussion mm -hmm. ideas of different levels of interaction mm -hmm. but i think some way to sort of organize this the the packages of of the way we are addressing these issues into something like a lookbook i don't know what that is but i'm just sort of throwing it out there mm -hmm. mm -hmm. way of, of going I, I really like this kumu tool this mapping tool i've been experimenting with it a little bit and jeff Lane, i know you have uh, and you've organized some of the readings using this uh, map. And it's kind of like a mind map, but there's something elegant about it. And there's something about the way the software is, I think, uh, the, U the UI is, is quite intuitive at the same, without being dumbed down. Like you can get fairly complex with the way that you map elements. Uh, so in this case, we're mapping books and authors and groups uh, who are reading these books. And... I could imagine that sort of branching out where you get a visual representation of the main kind of conversations that we've had and that are you know ongoing and that will come and and if you could start to develop some metadata around them like uh you know uh keywords um other you know taxonomic uh you know, um identifiers and put them into a mapping system, then you could start to get these interesting views on things. You could also get views on who's reading what or who's knowledgeable about what and um, where different kind of sources for media are, different reference sources. Uh, in a more complex system with more people involved, reading more books, it could be, you know, and, and as we sort of diverge and converge in, in our interests and go in different directions, it would be really, I think, interesting to have kind of the almost the equivalent of what Facebook has in an, in their social graph where they could see how all the connections are really sort of aligned and how really they have a, they have a map of the network they have a visual uh, an ability to visualize the network and then 
of course, you know, in their case, manipulated in various ways through the algorithm and the new, with the news feed and for, um, you know, just for their business purposes. But this could be a research tool. Like it could be a, a way of um, following a conversation in a sort of, in this really open frame um, that is being generated by the activity uh, and, you know, feeding the data into a graph that, uh, I mean, that, that's where I see the potential going for, for this. I mean, I, and I see the tools as ways of, um, I guess, str- learning about this, how that could be structured, uh, even if the tools themselves won't deliver the final, the final product, if you will, the final, uh, it's it, almost an augmented reality. You could look at it too, like an, an augmented reality for infinite conversations in a way. Given this, these kind of useful overlays to like this, you know, mass of of information. Like, who who could read all that stuff? I mean, there's so, so can, much stuff. Can Kumu provide actual links once you? So, if you have something like Gebser Ever Present Origin as one bubble, and then let's say you do Chapter One, Chapter Two, Chapter Three, can it have Chapter One? You click on a link, and that will take you to the Infinite Conversations type of but that would be maybe along the lines of what you're saying. Yeah, uh, you could include links in, you can add fields to the entities. Fields. Yeah, and you can add custom fields, and I think that they also include links. Uh, you could change the, the way that they're visualized uh, by, by uh, grouping them differently. It's, it's a really cool tool, uh, and you know, it's just a tool. We've talked a lot about technology and the sort of idolization of the tool. <laughs> Uh, and it's not, you know, so I want to be careful. It's not a replacement for actually doing the reading, actually participating. Like, that's what we're doing now. Like, we show up and there's this face-to-face experience that I think is, you know, more important than the organization knowledge with this with this app. But... Yeah, essentially, it could be the playbook in a certain sense. Like, you'd have that in your hand. There's the, your computer. Take your mouse or your direct touch to the screen and say, okay, well, we're, we're working on this and just go there. So it's a playbook. It's not necessarily going to change the way we do anything we're doing right now. So um, just to sort of uh, intervene a little bit, I have quite a lot of experience with Kumu because we've used it in the research center that I work in for a number of different applications. So it's sort of I haven't looked at, I don't know it all. And there are parts I, I noticed on the site, there are some front end tools that seem to be fairly new in the system. Um, but it tends to be a back end tool in the sense that um, for people who like this kind of stuff, you can get into and you kind of make sense of it. But it's not, in, not entirely intuitive, ob- obvious. And a lot, a lot of people, even in our organization, we had this idea well, we would make it available and researchers could go in and start manipulating it. But it didn't happen because the tools are sufficiently complex and sophisticated that there's, there's just not something you can pick up and do like that. And people who are busy don't take the time to work that out. So, but as a back-end tool, that is to say something that as a management that we put information in and organized it, and then with some sort of a front end where the, you, which is more a click and move around um, structure, um, it could work. So I'd have to, we'd have to look at the front end and see whether or not it's sufficiently versatile to use that way. Um, but I have found it extremely useful as a way of thinking about how things are linked and how things work together and, it allows you to flip from one understanding of things and then very quickly turn it around to look at a different perspective, uh, a different way of clustering or, or organizing things. So it's very useful as a kind of a, you know, as this infinite conversation gets larger and there are more stuff in it, these kinds of tools are going to become important in order to understand what's going on and be able to present them to the public in a way that's useful, I think. Hmm. It was the first tool I saw that looked like it would work in a way um, 
I'm just saying adequate, you know, to the complexity I was visualizing in my mind, because I mean, part of this, part of the feeling that I have, like the need to put information out to, you know, create these artifacts is that, you know, I, I started this project and it turned into like many different projects at the same time. It's a lot to, uh, that have to work together, you know, that, 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 that have to be integrated uh, and have to be dynamically integrating of, uh, of what they're about and people who are interested and the potentialities, etc. It's relatively small, but it seems to me that the implications of what we're doing are potentially relatively large if we design it well and if we really do have a sense of how the whole works together. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to map out the interrelationships and the the, um, holistic structures of not only a journal with, you know, exploring various topics in philosophy or literature or what have you, but then also the social layer involved and the economic layer involved, uh, the governance layer involved, the sort of purpose related and big picture world historical, like, you know, place in a, a larger set of dynamics dimension of it. It's it's more of it's it's not less more it's not just a project but it's a microcosm of a society and and in that respect I think having clarity around what things are and how they relate even though part of you know part of it is just purely inspired and purely poetic and whimsical uh, and that's sort of the infinite aspect of it um, for it to be grounded I think in real world practice. It needs at least on that back end to have that like self that self transparency uh, and that ability at least in principle for anybody to go in and be able to investigate what the structure is uh, and follow you know how certain things even came to be what they are how certain thought streams developed into ideas into concepts into uh, policies or into play you know roles uh, you know and anything that really is concrete has a history. And part of what we're doing in the forum is we're creating all the backstory, all the, all the backstory for what becomes concrete in actual productions, actual publications or uh, events. Uh, so uh, it's, it's fairly complex if, if you really look at all the sides to it. Uh, and, uh, and that's the light, you know, it was, it's overwhelming. It has been overwhelming, but I've been feeling lighter and lighter since I've, since putting this material out and also since knowing that other people are seeing important aspects of it and are making meaning with it and filling in gaps and extending it. Uh, That's like the more that that happens, the, the the more I I trust, I feel that, uh, that we're on the right path, if you will. And I think this slow, Fasting is very important as as well. Uh, I, I, I we've talked about revelations, all all of this stuff, the idea of doing a cosmos cooperative, the metapsychosis, a theory of everybody. These all came to me as revelations. And in the moment when you experience an idea and perceive intuitively its its potentials and what it could convene. Uh, you know, it's like a flash of, of, of the future and it seems like it should all just happen. But in reality, there are infinite little things that need to happen for it to happen. And those things are what take time. And those are the things, you know, where those are the details in which the devil, uh, you know, can be found. Uh, and so one has to dance with the devil and the details and you know, getting the structures right and getting like the, 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 the details right. And that's, yeah, I mean, that, that's a be, that has bedeviled me not, not to, uh, over, you know, not to pun too much, but, uh, but it seems like it's starting to work, you know, like we, we have a nice group here and 
uh, I think we have a lot of talent as well. I mean, that's the thing that really is encouraging to me is that you all are very talented. You all have, you know, backgrounds of experience and you know, ways that you've developed yourselves or have um, uh, insights that you bring into the space that I think have some really, um, I, I, I don't know, I, I think that they could, they could really sort of blossom in, in, in a way. Yeah. And I think it's only a, only a beginning. Uh, that's the, that's the, um, it's a, it's a long drawn out, painful beginning, but, it, but, uh, I think that the, the best is yet to come. So. You start any enterprise, Marco, it's long and it's painful. You, you never know when it's going to happen, but, um, aside from that, could you post a link or a pointer somewhere in the forum after this so that we know what, this Kumu, I, I, I never heard of this before. I'd like to take a look at it too, um, to see what it does. But in light of the conversation that we're having, I'm also getting an idea of what I think you would like it or some kind of tool to be able to do. And those are the kinds of things that I think would be very beneficial to the, uh, um, you know, to the platform as a whole. Uh, one of the things... It struck me today. Um, I don't. I don't track every conversation that goes on, and every title doesn't attract me. And so I'll look at something once and say, "Oh, that's very nice," and I'll go off. And then, then I realized, and I came across one. It was this little poem you'd posted. Don't ask me what the the name of the thread was. Um, I came across it again today, and all of the the postings were like weeks ago. And I'm going, well, well, why didn't I know about this? But there was no way for me to know that I, uh, that I wanted to know about it until it happened. But if we had something like keywords that were associated with me that were in the system, then the system, this is where I, you know, I'm very curmudgeon when it comes to AI, but there are some things that it does well. And I think where slaves are obedient and, and productive, they should be, you know, you know engaged. And so, that is one of those points where it, the system could have told me, oh, look, there's a conversation going over here that you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. Not in a Facebook sense, but in a real sense. And, mm -hmm. then, you know, and that's, that's where I'd like to make that distinction as well as, you know, because that's what I hear you're, you're saying. Yeah, very much. Yeah. So, that, so that, you know, we, we do get more involved and drawn into the things that interest us so that we can, you know, we can build upon those, those kind of things. So. Um, we, we need filters too. I, I would yeah, say. So, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You know, I mean, there, there's just too much otherwise. And yes, I didn't appreciate that as you know at the, at the early stages when mm -hmm. I'm just glad that somebody's posting something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because yeah, yeah. I was on I coming from Facebook. It's you know, every two seconds, there's something mm -hmm. happening. Like you can't pass a second there without, you know, a new notification or something new to, to look at. Uh, and this was, you know, crickets chirping for, for a while. Uh, so I was glad of it. Uh, now you know, it, it takes time and work, not just to follow a conversation, but to think about it to, mm -hmm. and I'm slow. I may, I, uh, I, you've talked Ed, about being, you know, a, a like the tortoise and the hare. I told him uh, <laughs> the tortoise is, <laughs> but I like to take my time and yeah. shoot things over. And I, 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 I would prefer for a conversation to draw out over time and really have room to breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, but for that to happen, there has to be some spaciousness. And I think that's what the filters kind of allow. And then to have a system sort of remind you or bring something back to your attention at an appropriate time that's sensitive to you, not because it wants to advertise to you, but because mm -hmm. it's there to serve you as a, as a conscious, as consciousness. Mm -hmm. That to me, that would be, I think a good relationship with technology. If we, if yeah. that's what our technology did, then that would be very useful. I think it, it would, it would uh, save a lot of our sanity actually. Well, actually, that's that's part of what I meant with my feeding the beast comment and the other the other thing. You know, there's it's there. We we can't avoid it. We can't throw it away, and we shouldn't. But if we can help develop it 
so that it, I, I'm really one of these, these folks who believes that technology is, is a tool that we've developed and that we are the masters of our tools, if that's, you know, the way you want to want to look at that. But these tools should be helpful to us. Not, they shouldn't tell us what to do and how to do it or when to do it, but they should, they should encourage us when, when it needs be, and they should remind us uh, or make us aware when, when we're not. And if, we, and if we can get it to do that, and that's, that's something that we actively have to do. And the only way that you can do that is to actively engage the technology. You know, you have to get in there. You have to roll around. You have to get your fingers dirty. It's, you know, it's like cleaning the toilet. Sometimes you have to reach in there and just, you know, literally pull the shit out. You know? And then, okay, then it flows and off you go. But, you know, and that's, that's part of, of how this all has to work. And I don't think this is, any, this is not a different world in that regard. So we have to get down into the nitty gritty and figure out what works and what doesn't. You know, that was the biggest challenge that, uh, that we had when, when I was trying to help my daughter develop her business was, was finding tools that everyone who was involved, because we had, we had a very small core of people who were the business, quote unquote, we were teaching English and doing uh, uh, English for business purposes. English is a foreign language. And all of our all of our um, our, our teachers were were freelancers, so so no, none of them were like part of the organization. But you have to inform them all the time. So trying to find ways to keep everybody in the loop and no one's getting ignored and everyone's taken care of and everybody can tell everybody else what they're doing. It was this this it was a tremendous challenge to find uh, the level of transparency that is necessary in order to do that so that it could all function. And, and we were, I think we were making some progress. We were using all open source tools to do it. We were trying to do it on, you know, because we had no money. We were trying to, you know, bootstrap ourselves, things like that. Very similar to what you're doing. So, you know, those experiences showed me that if we had a few very simple tools to help us remember, and re you know, I, I think a lot about memory these days because mine's going. You know, but, uh, but there are younger people who are simply overwhelmed by the amount of things that they have to do, so they don't remember. You know, there's there's lots of reasons why we don't remember. So having having things to to, to bring this back into our consciousness, think okay, well maybe this is something you would like to look at. You can always say no, I don't want to, mm -hmm. but at least you have the choice. And so you know, developing those kinds of things would be very very beneficial for the platform as a whole. Mm -hmm. Agree. I think this is related to the humane tech uh, movement as well. This is kind of the idea that they're planning, working with. Yeah, I, I'm not throwing away my hammers either, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm keeping it all <laughs> as far as I can keep it. So um, I wanted to say, Marco, that because um, you, you kind of – put out a call for help with the larger structure of the, of the site. And I have to say, when I looked at it, it's pretty complete. It's not got, it's maybe got a few holes and things, some of which I worked in, but, you know, I'm used to dealing with all sorts of things. And this is a fairly, it's already pretty together as an, as an, orga as an organization both the stuff that you do and the stuff that Catherine does, you know, they come together from different ways, but they make a part of a whole that is really quite substantive already. Um, and in order to be able to provide any kind of feedback in that kind of thing, you really have to get into the whole thing. Like you can't pick at a piece because hmm. the piece is connected to something else and everything else connected. You have to be able to get your mind into the whole thing. So the playbook helps because it, because it gives you a bit of a structure for that. And the codex helps a bit in another way as well. And so some of these tools are beginning, um, but it's, it's already quite a big beast huh? in order to manage and understand. And you sort of have to sit with it for a while. So I'm not sure I'm saying anything different, but I am saying that I appreciate the work that's gone into it because I think already there's a, a, a substantive amount of work that's gone into 
and and then you have to sort of sit with it and work with it as it is rather than you know the, the, I'm not going to come up with a whole section that's missing at this point. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Jeffrey. And yeah, I, I know you just, you mentioned the, the lookbook a little bit ago and I, I feel I'm really, I guess I came in November and I've already kind of explained my pathway of how I, I got here through a couple interest in metamodernism and then Gebser and yeah, but to see the bigger picture, it's definitely all there. It's just you have to kind of search around or spend a little extra time. So I, I do feel this this map or playbook here would be a, a good addition to newcomers. So, um, but yeah, like you're saying, Jeffrey, it is a the cosmos is complete. <laughs> There's a hmm. few few stars being discovered every now and then, uh, distant galaxies looming in all of our minds, possibly, but. It's, it's there. <laughs> I'm glad you think, think so. I, 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 <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree that general, generally in this kind of general schematic sense, the pe- like major pieces are out. Uh, I think that, you know, there are some really significant, mm, you know, uh, challenges uh to get from a sort of conceptual completeness to a, a living completeness where there is a su- there's a s- sustainability and a thrivability in the project that um can you know is self-subsistent and to be very practical about that like if if i were me per- personally marco morelli uh to fall on the ice uh and crack my head and go crazy uh, and or die. Uh, even if you all wanted to keep meeting, you wouldn't have the passwords to anything. You, you wouldn't have access to you know the website. I mean, there'd be all these things that uh, just hadn't been really integrated into a, into a system that uh, is kind of objectively accessible. It would all really still depend on on me, and then I'd be dead. So it has to get from that place where I'm a sort of point of failure in the system to where that, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of aspects that I hold are put in a place where others can take them and, you know, take them over. Oh. If so, I, so I feel that to, to move from the concept to the real, like, living organization where people have roles and things get done in a predictable manner and, you know, even unpredictable things are sort of planned for. Um, not that, I, you know, I'm not saying everything has to be planned for, but that it's really not all, it's not, I don't have to do it and I can participate uh, as a writer and as kind of like one of you. Um, that That's really what I want to achieve. And I think I won't rest well until I do. And so that that's part of the motivation too for getting like this, a playbook in place and then for actually getting like real actual organizational structures that are like legal and even, you know, so that people have access to things like money and passwords and so forth. And that's all like just part of like part of the, the, uh, the deal. Um, but yeah, again, like I was saying earlier, that's going to, I'd hope that that could happen two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted this all done. You know, I have things to do. I have, I have a lot of, I have a lot of writing to do. I have poems to write. I even have songs to sing. Uh, I want to read them. <laughs> so, but, but I want to have this sort of system in place because there, there really wasn't something there. There wasn't a place to go, uh, for me anyway. And I saw the same thing in others. Uh, I couldn't go back to academia. I didn't have the money for it. It just wasn't the the prospects are not, not there uh, anymore for somebody who's interested in the humanities. Um, and what else would there be? I mean, you could become a YouTube star. Uh, yeah. And and you're talking about the operational side, rather. So I was talking about the conceptual side. I think. Yeah. 
it's going to go there. The operational side is a whole different story, as you are pointing out. <laughs> yeah. It's to be done on the operational side. I mean, you know, I don't know how many members the, the, the co-op has right now, but 100 members maybe, or a little bit less, I don't know. But yeah, less. In terms of the active members, we're looking at a relatively small group. It would be nice to get a larger group eventually, you know, involved. And that's not obvious exactly how to do that, right? So, um, I mean, I think it will grow over time, but, but, and maybe we can just trust that. But, but would there may be things we can do also that will bring in other people in an engaged way within the thing if we think about it. So, um, and, and the other thing I wanted to say about it, which I've forgotten already, um, how was the, the devil in the details? So what's interesting about the devil in the details is that when you go into the details and work them through, you don't necessarily arrive at the place that you had outlined. What you get is, tr is transformations that change your perspective. And so you want to be able to do that because that's where the, the real the real new elements, the, the real possibilities emerge is in the details, not in the conception. So uh, it's the operational side that, that'll get us to those points. Hmm. It's, the, it's the shaman that counts. It's the road that matters, the path that matters, not the, not the goal that we set. Yeah, no, this is, this is, this is true. This is very true. But, uh, uh, well, just on the level of projecting forward into some kind of ideal future state and into mm -hmm. some kind of object that that you know that's being created, I think that that's uh, a red herring. And at the same time, I have you know it's important to have a star. It's mm -hmm. important to have something orienting, an orienting vision. But we have, but, but we're never going to get to the star. We're, you know, we're here now with each other. And that's as real as this is as real as it is right now. Um, and the operational thing and growing. What I feel is this is is that if we begin, if we have pl platforms and avenues for publishing work through the journal, through the forum. We we don't. There's no ad marketing. There's no going on. Occasionally, we send an email out. But it's not been in any way a systematic effort, uh, and I've never—I I haven't had the bandwidth personally to take it seriously. And and I would rather focus on the content and the depth of the conversations than on email blasts about them. Uh, at the same time, I think that there are other people out there who would really per appreciate what we're talking about and how we're talking about it, and would like to participate if not directly in these conversations, then in a space more generally that is supportive of these types of conversations and who I think you could participate in the general ethos of the kind of peer-to-peer -peer type of platform uh, and bring their own skills, uh, you know, uh, gifts uh, and experiences into, into the space just in the way everyone here has. Uh, and, and in that way, it becomes a more, um, uh, it, it grows, it feeds on itself. But we need, we need the structures to, to contain that and to really kind of keep it orderly because you can't just pile, you know, a thousand people into one big room and ex expect, you know, productive activity to unfold. Uh, now, there is a way people self-organize, of course, you know, in groups, but having some general templates and patterns first that we work out in smaller in these smaller venues, you know, it, it seems like time has been our friend in a way because it's allowed us to learn a lot of things that if we had been to, you know, if we'd had a th you know, thousands of people early would have completely overwhelmed, uh, you know, the, the intentions. I saw your hand go up, Ed. No, no, I was just waving back to uh, Zachary who, uh, who would wave. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> like across the hall. <laughs> How do you know I was looking at you? But I was. Okay. Um, I had just a couple of comments before I forget them, Marco. I didn't I didn't want to interrupt you. I wanted to have a non-virtual hand raise. 
Um, so first point, just I, I really do like the idea of you creating uh, some kind of document for the metapsychosis nuclear codes and then <laughs> kind of sharing them with multiple individuals or something so that uh and then with with the disclaimer that 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 these individuals must connect in some way shape or form even for just a minute you know like once a year for the rest of their life <laughs> and then like they must pass those down or, or that if any point in time, you know, let's say the four or the five or whoever, you, you know, whoever, you know, this was to be a thing. If anyone dies, that immediately someone else must be chosen kind of like, I don't know, the Club of Rome or something where mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's a <laughs> through death that yeah, gets passed real on. Spooky, real fast. <laughs> you know, always with a webmaster must be present. It can't just be a bunch of like <laughs> art historians. <laughs> Yeah, I must scramble for a webmaster at least once. So that was just something I wanted to kind of share because I thought that could be a kind of a cool idea. And yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing we could actually do it like cryptographically with smart contracts and things like that. Like we could set up those sorts of you know lineages of succession and uh, right. you know shards of information. These kind of distributed keys that need to be you know put together. These many rings, if you will. I mean, because uh, yeah, I, I really something that I really have admired is the you know the 10,000 year clock that, that Jeff Bezos is funding for the Long Now Foundation. Mm. I've really just admired that. I've admired the scope of that. And I've to be honest, I've just kind of like enviously wanted to be part of something like that. And I don't know if that's possible, but I do like the idea of thinking along grand timelines. Mm. Um, just to throw that out as well. Whether or not they're possible. Mm. Okay, so if you look under the playbook, under Future Cosmos, there's this thing called the ARC Project. Mm -hmm. The Cosmos ARC Project. And Is this in the Apple document, by the way? Uh, it's not there. If It's on the... Um, maybe it is there, actually. But it's, uh, it's on the discussion thread of the topics uh, for the playbook. And... Uh, I don't want to say too much about it because I just have the kind of the snippet of it. But the, I, the, and this is not on the order of the 10,000 year clock. That's very cool. Uh, and I saw that. I saw that story recently, uh, too. It's one of the things you could do, you know, with a few billion dollars. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do worry about my work. And, you know, I, I know that the world doesn't, you know, I'm not Shakespeare. The world may not regard me as any you know, an important voice, but, you have children. but I've put a lot, I've, I've children. Yeah, we don't know that. You have no idea. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that anybody who has worked hard on a create, on a craft, literary, creative, scientific, any wants their work to pres to be preserved. You know, they've poured mm -hmm. time, energy, everything into it. And I worry about things like, uh, you know, like solar flares and, um, you know, technological collapse. I mean, these kinds of things that could just totally wipe out like reams of data. We need to have some way of taking like the most important data that we have and putting it in safe keeping. So, I mean, for me, that would be as simple as uh, archival DVDs, for example, taking all the forum stuff and putting it on ar archival DVDs and having some kind of regular process once a month or something gets put in a safety deposit box. But then what about Jeffrey's magnum opus? And what about, you know, Doug's projects and Ed's novel and like all the, let's say all the cosmos members, if they have material that they want to put in this arc, it would kind of like be a s archival service that gets crypto, like gets passed down so that when you do pass, it becomes available mm -hmm. to the future for uh, for exploration, you know, for an archaeology. Right. Like, if we take ourselves seriously as artists and as thinkers, and why shouldn't we? Uh, like, who else is going to take you seriously if you don't take, you know, if right. we don't take ourselves seriously, then I would want my work to be preserved. I don't know what it is, you know? <laughs> like, I have all... I don't know what it is yet. So, maybe through, AI, you know, some kind of AI-enhanced future self... We'll figure it out, but they have to have access to what I did. They have to see my notebooks and stuff. And like, you know, the, the university is not going to do it. So why don't we do it uh, for 
just do it ourselves because it's that that's a future project is I guess what I'm saying. And, and the, the, the point to the 10,000 year clock idea is that, uh, you know, there are many institutions out there that are dedicated to knowledge, but, but there's so much knowledge we have to carry it forward in some, in some way. And that's a real practical human, I think, task, a historical task. And, uh, I don't know. I don't want. It's not. I don't want to get too self-important about it because it all sort of, you know, is emptiness at the same time. But, uh, but for the relative part of us, yeah, it feels good to have some kind of preservation time capsule of these things without being narcissistically self-important. True. Yeah. There's something called the future library. I don't know if you've heard of, but uh, I think. Well, at the beginning, it was Margaret Atwood and David Mitchell um, wrote a novel, and no one's going to see it for 100 years. And I'm a little pissed off about that because I, I like David Mitchell's works, but uh, that's a great idea. And it's not the, the only project, of course, and it goes along with the, the ARC project as well in a certain sense. But So there's a book... Um uh, my whole opus, magnus opus, as you mentioned, Marco, is based or is inspired or, or started around this book called The Physics of Immortality by Frank Tipler. <laughs> Tipler is a physicist and he wrote, he's treated a bit like a crazy, he's not treated seriously by the scientists. Yeah, yeah, he's a crazy ant in the attic. <laughs> but, the, but the scope of his vision yeah, floored me when I read it. Yeah. What his idea is, I mean, it's this, it's a totally crazy idea, but that one could one could engineer the universe for all us all to live forever, and then he he takes the whole book to show how this could be done. Yeah. I mean, it's engineering at the very largest scale of the universe. <laughs> if you like. um, I mean, it, you know, and it's crazy, but there's something about the audacity of the of the whole idea. Yes. That really spoke to me and so my whole thing is based on that argument <laughs> okay so i go for the ten thousand year clock i go for <laughs> i'm with you there too but i didn't think anybody else had read tipler and i'm glad i there's somebody else there thank you jeffrey <laughs> so is this part of a kind of grand project within the universe of of your novels is the attempt to build a, a universe of immortality? In my novel, it's the it's the guy who it's the guy who becomes the monster. Because <laughs> <laughs> in trying to do that, he creates untold damage in order to get to this. So it's this kind no. of <laughs> <laughs> okay. so he's the monster. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that's pretty uh, cool. I would, like, I would like to hear more about that, Jeffrey. <laughs> point. I would like to read more about it, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> gonna have to have to open the the other book there, Jeff. <laughs> well, I, I'm try I spent the last week or so trying to finish the first book of the opus, so the first. <laughs> manuscript so I can get it into a publication stream. That would be good. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> so Zachary, we're going to be, I, sent, I saw your bio, we're going to be publishing um, your piece soon. The human singularity is nearer. And I thought there might be a tie in to what we were speaking about earlier with, you know, the relationship between humans and technology. And now we should probably save that like a fuller discussion, but I just yeah. wanted to point that out. Like we have, we have like everyone here has some projects in progress and uh, Doug does, you do, Jeffrey does, Ed, Ed I assume does. He's meant <laughs> hinted, hinted at various things. Um, since this is an open frame, I, I'm curious to just kind of where people are at with their projects and uh, like how, you know, what would be helpful uh, to, to move forward uh, with, with what we're working on. There was also the, the Black Panther 
uh, movie. I wanted to ask about that because we don't, you know, we have we. I do a metastasis editorial meeting with Wendy and Bridget, uh, but we haven't really talked about some of the other things that that we're doing. So I'd be curious to. That wasn't a very cl- clear or direct question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I watched Zach's dual interview with, is it Daryl? Daryl. For the Black Panther. And I thought that was a great addition to just a comment you made, Marco, about, hey, this guy has a nice little 10-minute tidbit about the movie. And then Zach did an hour-long conversation with the guy, reached out on his own, I believe. I don't know if you and uh, Marco suggested Marco. it. I just kind of jumped on it for fun. And yeah. he was great. I th- I, I'm glad you thought it was okay. Uh, it was so. it was a great summary of the movie, and you guys feed off each other very well. So, however, yeah, you felt ex- on the inside, it was. <laughs> I mean, it's a very touchy subject, and you're speaking with a black male, so. It's, yeah. No, I was. Well, the thing is, I was very passionate. I was really enjoying myself, but I know that. <clears throat> I kind of don't have very. I would you kind of might say conservative boundaries around where I allow my conversation to go. So I kind of very well just very easily breeze into certain areas that I know will be culturally and socially touchy. And I felt like I did that. And I, and I might just, my worry, which I'm kind of assuming seems to be okay. Like I, I was going to make an ass of myself or I was going to say something that was inappropriate or presumptuous or I don't know, whatever. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that that was, that was okay. Uh, you know, if Doug gives it the blessing, then Marco, by all means, please uh, go for it. Um, once again, I, I had a really nice time with, with Daryl. He's a lot of fun. And to be honest, we just, you know, we, he's much younger. I mean, you think he's like, I mean, he's, he's quite brilliant. I think he's only like 23 or 24. And mm-hmm. so we had a very millennial style conversation. It was just a hundred miles an hour, back and forth, back and forth. And there were still a bunch of things I didn't say, but I, I thought he, he, we both drew out some, some interesting elements from each other. Especially like the the ending, which I don't think I'm giving too much away here, but you two go into, which I, I don't care much for Marvel comics or comics in general, but uh, identifying, identifying the elders in the world around us and who would fit in as the comic book character. Right. Uh, was right. pretty interesting. The real Avengers. You guys couldn't identify very many, <laughs> which goes along with what I'm working on. And yeah, I can't identify anybody except for the the small small everyday people really so i don't want to talk about that right now i I just want to point out like what exactly happened here because i think it's a good example of like the kind of thing that could happen more so and and it's it was just a serendipitous connection really you know that i picked up on and then you picked up on Mm -hmm. and now we have this video Mm -hmm. of you talking with this you know young man about this cultural object, this movie that's of you know it's a it's a lot of meaning to a lot of people right now. It's time. Mm-hmm. This is a timely uh, kind of a mm-hmm. thing, but it was you know it was just through following intuition. Like I, a phrase came into my mind, Mythos Collective, because I was trying to think of channel names mm-hmm. from the psychosis. The idea that we might have content in different channels. So mm-hmm. the kind of thing that Br- Bridget works on, or Jonathan Cobb, or uh, you know, there's a there's a stream of thought that has to do with looking at mythos, mythological themes in mm-hmm. not just in contemporary culture, but grounded in a sense of you know ancient mm-hmm. myth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, anyway, the idea of mythos collective came into my, my mind. I googled it, and this guy Daryl's YouTube channel came up because he calls himself Mythos Collective, or he calls yeah. his channel Mythos Collective. And I just it's like let me let me start looking at. I watched a few of his videos, and I just liked them like he i liked his personality and i'm no, i noted i made a mental note oh here's a video editor uh that could be useful <laughs> like you know right. and um and so then you mentioned black panther and then i happened to see that he recorded uh like i got a notification uh, on mm-hmm. on our youtube channel like because i subscribed to him that he'd recorded something and i just made the connection posted in the forum then you picked up on it and then you needed to, you need, we had a technical issue too. Like you, you didn't have the right, right. Zoom account, et cetera. Uh, it was totally spur of the moment. You know, it wasn't like even scheduled. So there are a lot of things we can learn from that from a sort of playbook perspective mm-hmm. in terms of like how it happened 
And then even the details, like the technical things, you needed to reach out, you need to find contact info, you need to schedule it, you need to record it. We had a video file out of it. And now we have a video file. And what are we going to do with it? Like as an editor, I'm thinking about, well, we can, let's, what can we do? We can publish what? A piece, a review, a discussion on Black Panther. I want to see the film now because I want to relate to what you've said. And that could be something that becomes an attractor in a larger cultural field. Similar to the way that Stranger Things, uh, when J.F. Martel wrote an essay, a multi-part essay about the Netflix series Stranger Things, that um, got picked up, you know, different people linked to it. And I can think of two to three people who got, who came to the forum and started participating because they found that essay, read it, and then uh, picked up on the bigger, you know, project. Um, so how could that all happen more fluidly is sort of like the question. Mm-hmm. And uh, how could we sort of encourage like more of that and then make it easy to get, you know, to do something like a conversation that like that and then publish it so that it becomes part of a culture. That's, um, I think it was really just really cool the way that that worked out. And like, that's yeah. the kind of thing that makes me think, okay, we're on to something like this is, this is working. Yeah. yeah. So we need to get the millennials to do the dirty work really. <laughs> well, we, we have to do more than that because I have no idea what you guys are talking about. <laughs> I'll, I'll play the middleman, but being the youngest person here, I, I think even I, out of all the participants and the members and possibly anybody that signed up, I might be one of the youngest people here at 35. And, and that's, well, and that's I, I don't know. No, I don't know what, about this, the video, the talk, the whatever, none of that. It was just a movie. It, there was a movie that came out called Black. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. But you guys are talking about something that you did here, and I know nothing about it. I agree. I know nothing about it either. Nothing about it. Nothing. Zero. Uh, oh, right, right, right. So this is what I was saying before about also having the system inform us that there's mm. something that might be of interest to you. Mm. That that. that um, this isn't a criticism. It's not a complaint. It's not. This is this is this is the example I was looking for a little earlier. Mm-hmm. Ranjo, I don't mind not knowing and picking it up. Yeah, I, I don't either. But now I got something. Oh, well, I'd really like to know a lot more about that. And, yeah. and I really would have liked for the system to have told me about it. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I don't think there's a systematic tool that would have told you about it because you wouldn't have been interested in. It. Nor would you be interested in seeing the movie at this point, other than maybe. After a year, because how, how do you I, know I'm that? just I'm young how, enough how do to you understand. Know what I might be interested. In? <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I'm right. just going. But I'm I'm the best tool you have for that right now. So you have to go off what I'm saying. Yeah. But, well, I'll, I'll accept that. He, he, I, I, I accept that. No, I'm I'm, just, I'm I'm saying that I don't think what you're looking for is possible. Like just like my John Bot idea is not possible because it's going to take away some. But uh, but. Me being the youngest member here is there's a whole demographic of young whippersnappers that no, I uh, think that's great and definitely potentially. So maybe we can reach out to that crowd. And Daryl is very intelligent. He's 23 and he surpasses me on IQ by 200 points. I can tell just by the way he talks and he's got energy and a lot of us and time and maybe a potential career can come out of editing videos on what we have here or something like that. I don't know, but just for me to be the youngest whippersnapper here is. Caroline's is, uh, actually younger than you. She's, I think, 30. Oh, but she's never here. <laughs> oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> me, man, here. <laughs> hey, hey, Marco, just on a, on a minor note, if you know any. Sorry, women future who, Caroline. If you anyway. know any women who ever want to talk about uh, Wonder Woman, that was something, when I saw Wonder Woman, like I was kind of like weeping like a baby, like in the first like four minutes really and i really wanted to have a conversation with a woman about that movie when it came out because in a way for me that was like that was the same as black panther just for women i mean wonder woman and black panther like right there these two you know huge demographics that are kind of pop culturally coming of age with those movies i never got a chance to talk to anyone about that and i thought there were some incredibly archetypally coherent psychologically coherent elements in that movie so it was true all the the women i knew went to see the film 
cried their eyes out along with me, and none of the men talked about crying their eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be a third to say the same thing, and maybe that goes along with what I was saying, Ed, is you probably wouldn't be crying at any of these movies. Or... <laughs> Again. But, I, I, but we, maybe <laughs> we just, we don't know that side of you. I don't know what you're like, talking about. What are you talking about? What are you we talking about? We don't know that side of you. Ed. I don't know what so, you're talking about. <laughs> There is a thing about the millennials. So there is there is um, this this tendency to um, not fully give the background details and just launch into things is very millennial in style. It's not at all the way we were raised. The way I was raised is if you introduce a new topic into a conversation, you provide traditional background ahead of time so the person understands what's going on. But that's not the way the millennials do it at all. You must speak in essay form. Cultures. It's fra- It's a fragmentary style of communication, right. I think. Which is okay. Just just as an anecdote, the thing about living and and working with Germans is you always start with Adam and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> no background may be given that doesn't start with Adam and Eve, <laughs> which is the exact opposite of all of that. Personally, I like to start pre-edenically. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really good to, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, adverse to people jumping in. I think that's okay, too. You know. Pre-diluvian, pre-edenic, you want to start right at the beginning. Oh, why not? That's what they do. And, 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 that may, and it is a style thing. I agree with Jeffrey on that point. Um, and it's one that even us old curmudgeons have to adapt ourselves to. But we have to know about it before we can adapt to it. Can I throw one more thing in, Marco? I, I, I wanted to just share this with you. Um, uh, about six, five or six years ago, uh, I can't even remember exactly now, I actually I recorded uh, an open letter to the integral community, I think. I don't know if you ever saw okay, that. Okay, so before we, before we go any further, by the <laughs> integral community... I got that part from before. Uh, I know enough. <laughs> I'm I'm good there. Great. But I'm aware. Okay, I'm aware that Doug and Jeffrey may not have that context. Okay. I don't have the contact. Just you know, the collective of people that kind of surround themselves, or who who at a time were surrounding them, surrounded. How do I even put this? Surrounding themselves mm-hmm. around the work, uh, mainly the body of work of philosopher Ken Wilber. Mm-hmm. Yourself, you know, self Ken Wilber, styled. who I could never read. I was never able to get into it. I tried several times. Mm. Okay. But you're aware of him. And yeah. Yeah. Very, okay. Well, it's just kind of interesting because I, I, uh, I went to a few of their conferences and kind of enjoyed it. At the time, I, I had felt that, that this g- group that was you know, in some ways transcendental and could appreciate the philosophical and could, were kind of pulling together all these different strands uh, were the kind of community that I felt like, you know, something can be done here. I really want to, you know, make some connections and, and see if we can do something in a really collective fashion. I felt like another kind of integral term, but just this idea of the collective we, you know, the intelligence of the group mind, the intelligence of the group we coming together in multiple tentacles to create something that was just greater than the sum of its parts and certainly greater than whatever any one of us can do individually. And I felt like there was a, a kind of selfless giving to this greater beast that could produce something. And so I wrote this, uh, little piece it was which is kind of so funny so i kind of was looking for it the other day i was like is it still on youtube somewhere privately can i still find it? i haven't found it i, don't, I think i have i have the the written piece of it but anyway i kind of put it out on facebook like five years ago and not too many responses i got a few responses here and there and then i just kind of dropped it and the whole idea was like pulling together this uh what i described as like a kind of delta force of creativity that that would identify certain key leverage points in pop culture you might even call those just things that are trending like really like the you know like a mass shooting so it's key moments but that that interested a certain number of us that individually had had specific expertise say in content creation video editing marketing right like there's a, there's a little delta force there that could actually potentially create like a piece of work and then just shoot that shit out. 
Mm-hmm. And this was just a kind of really just a random idea I had. And I was really, really excited about it at the time. Nothing happened. And then like five years later or something, like metapsychosis appears. And it took me kind of a while to realize that, or at least to believe in some strange way that actually you, Marco, kind of, whether knowing that I had put that call out or not, kind of, for me, answered the call that I was looking for. And then, and then you kind of did me one better and did your own video, <laughs> that very poetic <laughs> video that begins with, you know, like something like, what, 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 what is this thing inside of me? Is it a monster? <laughs> is it yeah. God? And I really appreciated that. And I was like, oh, it's interesting. He kind of, and I, once again, like I, I have no idea if you ever even saw the video that I put out, but I was really intrigued that that was there. So I kind of say all that thing just because for me, my own per- personal mythology, we all have a kind of a personal mythology around our lives. Uh, very much has like me putting that thing out and then five years later, like seeing that as I go to seeing your thing going, Oh wait, that's like, that's to a certain degree, like what I'm looking for. It's a group of, you know, this guy did it. Like I would, I, I, I'm not the kind of person that can pull all of this infrastructure together the way you did. Marco. It's just on my skills, you know, I'm not you the did kind it. of person either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did it despite well, the kind of person I am, <laughs> but yeah, that's right. Well, hats I, off to you. I, you know, I think I actually, at some point after you got in touch with me, I think I saw it because you gave the talk at like an integral life. That wasn't it though, but that, oh, that wasn't it. That's that what I saw. All right. That's what I saw. Yeah. That it, was like a, that was like a speech I gave at, at what next? At yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. An integral conference. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's out there. Cause it's on Vimeo or something, but yeah, my one was just like on a little personal video channel. It was just very much like I should send, I'll send you the, the, the text of it. It would be great that to was, find the old footage because it was really, it was me like in my office was just like a black suit and a red scarf, just, just kind of angrily like shouting, not really shouting, just angrily, like just like a train. They used to describe, what is it, that country and Western singer who I love, Johnny Cash, like a train just going down the tracks. That was kind of how I was speaking. I'd love to find that one day. But anyway, I'll send you the script maybe just so you can kind of see what I was talking about. Sure. Because so to, 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 to dovetail back to what you're saying, I think, and once again, we don't have to do any of this. I feel like future John, I, I don't know. I sometimes wonder if future John would be uh, somewhat, I don't know, just he'd feel that this is a little too uh, pointed towards marketing or something. And we should be more relaxing in the process. Maybe not. You tell me future John, what do you, how does this feel to you? But <laughs> But, but for me, that would be, I thought that'd be a really interesting thing. And you could like, I don't, so I'd really, really thought about this for a long time. The idea, like take Kickstarter. The idea would be, there would be a forum or something on metapsychosis somewhere. And there would be seed projects, seed projects. And someone would say, okay, I got a seed project around Black Panther, right? I really want to do like a whole something and let's make it really cool and really fantastic. Or let's do something around the, the mass shooting. I have an answer to this mass shooting. Some of it's been said before. Some of it's not been said before. Let's throw this out and let's do something really amazing. And they would just sit there like Kickstarter projects. And instead of funding the money, you'd have to get a tipping point of the Delta Force team, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. Four or five people come together. You need the editor. You need the, the marketer, the social media person to go out there and kind of do a you know, tinker with it. And you need the content creator. And then maybe you need like the person who's going to act it out or whatever. I don't exactly know, but what I mean is we can see that if you're going to throw stuff out there and really make impact, it's got to be put together. Mm -hmm. You know, I was saying this like seven years ago, like in the age that we're in, if you're going to write an academic paper, you, you've got to, you've got to do a music video to pull along with it in this day and age. Like that's kind of how my thinking is with this digital landscape, this integral, you know, world that we're living in. You got to have a dance video to put with your academic paper. And that's the kind of stuff that really gets noticed if you're interested in that. And so I'm interested in the ideas of it. As you know, I'm kind of more of a, I'm definitely more just on the content side. That's what I'm doing. I don't really have much talent anywhere else and certainly no inclination. But I wanted to throw that out just in terms of, um, yeah, I think one of the terms I'd use in that original speech was something like, you know, using this as like a kind of a harpoon, this Delta Force would be like shooting out harpoons into the blubber of mainstream thinking. Oh gosh, that sounds like Moby Dick. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, hell with yeah, Ahab, man. Yeah, it all comes. Back. <laughs> it all comes back to Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Which, incidentally, I should say, yeah. there's a guy called Jed, Jed McKenna who wrote like three books, most of which are not that great, but it was all about uh, kind of enlightenment from a slightly cynical, slightly whatever standpoint. He had some good points, but his second one was really interesting. The entire book was all about how Moby Dick, it was a critical analysis of Moby Dick and how it was actually really all about um, enlightenment and annihilation and how the narrator actually is, oh, I'm not going to remember it exactly, but the, so basically a, the narrator is Ahab and he doesn't die and he actually comes back. So if anyone's really, really interested in literary criticism of Moby Dick, Jed McKenna, the second book on spirit, it's called Spiritual Warfare or something, has a really interesting approach. Okay, shut up now. Well, I really like, uh, Zach, this idea of, a, I don't know, creative crowdsourcing or something like that. Mm -hmm. It, it right. is really some things yeah. I've been doing with my colleagues here, looking at something like that. But what we've been focusing on is on tools to engage people. Mm -hmm. So how do you get, how do you bring the people in? So we've been thinking through the process of engaging people. Anyway, I think it may be complementary to the kinds of, that kind of thinking that you're talking about, which mm -hmm. I think is really interesting. Um, before we, I don't know if we're finishing up or not, but the time is certainly in that area. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come back to Doug's work on the elders and because I think it's a really interesting project. And I know you, you sort of threw it out rather tentatively. And since then, it's, it's got some crack traction to it. And uh, I, I don't want to put any kind of pressure on you in terms of your own process about it. But I'm thinking, I'm sort of wondering, are there things that we can do as a group to support your efforts to develop that into something a little bit more tangible? That's the, the question that I have. So in a certain sense, which has nothing to do with Marco's vision here on this site and but I kind of see it as coming that way. Like I had this shot of revelation from reading Ann Roberts' paper. It's completely, her dissertation, and it's completely not anything from the dissertation at all. But it's, it's become something that when I read another article, whether it's related or not, it's, it's going to become engulfed in this paper somehow. So it's becoming my own personal cosmos in a way of how I want to live my life. It's a reflection of who I am, who I've been. Um, when, I, when I say things like I've not had a conversation about intellectual things, like I have not. Um, the Quaker group was, um, for example, th they have a Quaker AIDS group, which, which has like dinners maybe once a month with certain groups of people. They might be one group goes and sees a movie and discusses that or goes to a cafe and sits there. I was in the family group, but this, the second time we met was literally the first time I shared an idea that I had. I think at the time it was nobody, nobody there knew what um, UBI was, universal basic, basic income. And for me to simply vocalize that was foreign to me. Even at, at college, I kept to myself. I had friends, but they were not the type to discuss these type of things with. So for me, I, I'm learning how to um, speak <laughs> in a literal sense. I, I, uh, I feel like I've greatly improved the first Cosmos Cafe. I, I'm very nervous. I'm very jittery. That's not even occurred to me. Or 10 minutes beforehand, I'll be like, oh, crap, if I'm going to be the first one, I'm, I'll have to talk one-on-one -on -one with somebody and, I know Marco has said the same thing in a few videos with people or even the, 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 the video that I shared for this, this um, cafe. Um, it was one of Marco's first and he mentions that kind of feeling of anxiety. Um, so that's, that's going away and I'm, I'm forcing myself to come out and it's a relatively new thing. And 
people like Ed who say, wait a minute, Doug, you, you mentioned something about the, the Muslim and Muslim and and then I'll take a step back and say, well, yeah, I wanted to leave that out. And so it it leads and we even discussed it in an email off topic or off the main topic because I didn't want to continue the thread that way. But I, I learned a lot from that and I learned how to fact check my own work and not be the, the millennial mind and just say, well, I want to throw this out. But at the same time, that's what I'm doing because I've never done that before. I'm branching out. So going back to the paper, it's about sponsoring elders. And my concept of elder is it's very misleading what I have written there and what I possibly have responded to various people. But I, I see anyone as the potential elder. My four-year-old son is more of an elder than I am at times when he has some sort of insight or he's taking a step above the learning process or he just learned how to read and now he's sharing 10 minutes of this or that that he learned for the day and it blows my mind. Um, So there's a way for us all to be elders and it takes a certain mindset, it takes a certain mentality, it takes a certain society, which I, I mentioned the gift, uh, the gift economy, um, which I've kind of thrown off to the side, but I want to bring it back in um, into the paper. So this this idea, whatever paper I want to write, and I'm a horrible writer, by the way, I write like I previously spoke. You guys are saying I'm proving, but <laughs> like to to take my my various galactic entities that are forming and to make them into a cohere cohesive sphere is impossible at this point and Scriv- scrivener works very well but it's I've, I've got a little laptop here i don't have a big old screen or a 10 foot wall like zach said he had to for his project to kind of work with uh, so it's the ideas are still jumbled but I don't even remember what the original question was, but I, all of you, in a way, just like you, Jeffrey, are are helping me form this, and it's not mine. It's not my creation anymore, nor do I necessarily even want to write a paper <laughs> on it. I'm, eventually, I hope to get around to it, um, but I, I keep taking in new aspects each day. It, it seems to me it's more like... Um, um being present for this emerging topic area and finding, and so you talk about a paper, for instance, I'm not entirely sure that it's a paper you want to produce. Mm -hmm. You want to be sit with the subject material and work with the subject material and then see what emerges from it Mm -hmm. in terms of how it gets presented to a wider audience. Might not be a paper, might be a video, might be, uh, a discussion group might be, I don't know what, you know, it could be m- one of many things, but r- rather than prejudging that it's necessary one form. But I also think it's a very interesting project to nurture as a group um, and help you find your way through the, you know, to the extent that we can help. So I, I, just, I just, I mean, I don't think we're going to solve anything today. I just want to bring it forward as a, an area for the group to think about how we can, we can help with this. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that very much. And I have had ideas like instead of sharing a back and forth with Anne through a conversation, I'm, I want to tell her, well, let's just talk on video for a couple hours or let's get four or five people like you're saying together and talk mm-hmm. about it. And that's where new ideas come from or old ideas come into newer projects. And- could, could we do a, Cafe? Did you already do a cafe on it, or? Mm-mm, not yet. I don't think so. No. No, no not yet. A good topic for a cafe. No. Sure. Maybe you could get uh, and uh, join in as well. If we time it right. Mm-hmm. That'd be nice. And I, mm-hmm. I do see us kind of taking those groups, whether it's Daryl, individual Daryl on the YouTube channel, or Heidi and Mark on the Wisdom Factory have their mm-hmm. own project and it's more geared towards the the youtube video rather than the conversation that follows mm-hmm. um but that that's those are the the outlying stars that we can make journeys to or reach out and uh, do some light speed travel to and realize we're all interconnected in some way mm-hmm. 
Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any particular thoughts on this, Ed? No, no, I'm uh, I'm good. I I think uh, I think just in relation to this last uh, topic that came up, um, Doug, you're you're going to find out what it is that you want to do. You may not know now, but you will, and that's what what Jeffrey more or less just said. And my feeling is. Just try whatever you're comfortable with and do whatever you think you want to do whenever you do it. And the one nice thing about the, this Infinite Conversations, not just the small group that we have here, but the platform itself, in my experience, is um, people will let you know what they think, but nobody's going nobody's gonna to bite your head off. And that's also a very important thing because too often we get – shied away from things that we would would like to do because uh, the critique that comes is is too hard. So you've done a, lo- a number of things like the video contributions to our conversations when you weren't there. I thought that was a really great idea. It was a really nice approach. And just to, because you are in a formative stage and you've gone through like one iteration, you know, with Anne on this whole thing on concretizing what it is that you would like to to work towards, it, it really could be very beneficial if we could all just sit down and chat about it once. And if we could get Anne to come in there too as well, because she's got experience in, in, in other areas as well, that would be, I think that would be a really interesting and beneficial for me. And, and you know, that's not even my, my primary focus of anything, even though I'm one of those old people that should be sponsoring something or other. Um, but but it's 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 one of those things where I think it would be very beneficial as a whole because everybody can learn something from what it is that would come out of that. So it's just it is something to think about. Maybe not, you know, and and what it is that you you finally produce as a result of it. I'd worry about that later. <laughs> it'll 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 make when it when the time comes. It will make itself known, and you'll know. Believe me, you will know, and then you can do it. But I wouldn't worry about what it is now. It'll tell you when it's time. I do have a couple of ideas. (laughs) I have a couple of ideas for for you on that. (laughs) Uh, If you go to the playbook, there's a line there. It's inspired by you. Uh, It says, free your inner elder. I noticed. <laughs> okay. I picked up on I thought, that. <laughs> I was imagining, you know, sort of a little, you know, blurb or thing uh, that might be a, it could be kind of what comes out of whatever your process is. One of the things could be a little guide, you know, how, how do we work with uh, mm-hmm. our elders and with the elders within us in this community? That could be something that like a concrete, practical, you know, result of, of your work. Awesome. The other piece, I would like, I'm, I've proposed. That, uh, I would like for there to be in the governing structure of Cosmos a place for elder perspectives, and particularly, I'm thinking of that would be something like a wisdom council, uh, which would be a group of people that would be widely um, respected in the community who are old, you know, of age, like literally, you know, 60 and above, something like that. So, you know, having life experience practically in their embodied particularity uh, and having that, having a role in the overall sort of ecosystem of how, how the organization uh, governs itself in particular, not just an advisory role, but kind of a adjudicating role uh, in a way that the Supreme Court, for example, adjudicates conflicts that can't be solved between you know, Congress and the president. The Wisdom Council would be kind of like the perspective of last resort. Like when you cannot just figure something else, something else out, go to the group that has the broadest experience, the, the least, um, you know, the least uh, uh, investment in particular partial perspectives, able to take more of the holistic view and think about the deep time, think about the long now and provide maybe that horizon or that scope when 
other parts of the community maybe are less, you know, more more fixated on on uh, uh, narrower uh, contexts. So I thought, well, that would that you know that maybe that's something that could also come out of of your work as some thinking around, you know, that and how how would that even be convened and uh, what would be like the way that well how how would a group like that inter you know fl- how how would they flow with everything else that's going on is, is I guess you know be part of the whole is is what I'd be curious to to see unfold. Hmm? I like it. So, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to mention that earlier was the the list of organ or, organizations and people that you had on the playbook list. And I did like the Wisdom Council and just the various potentials for members and the potential groups or committees that might form if it was branching out to 200, 300 people here on the site or something. Mm-hmm. Just a thought for now. Yeah. Well, that was, that was nice. It's good to have mm-hmm. an open uh, forum just to surface uh, what's been on our respective, you know, on our minds. Yeah. yeah. This is really good. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed it too. Yeah. Find the time in the middle of the day. Yeah. And uh, next week we have... Um, uh, Lisa, right? Lisa, Lisa Morowski. Morowski. Yeah, uh, we, and John set that up, and uh, Doug, you you were helping him with some technical things too. Was did that go okay? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll uh, do that <laughs> pre clean language conversation tomorrow night. So uh, I'll be getting with you possibly on the best way. I haven't done an extended one hour upload. I don't know oh. if I have the capabilities um, or knowledge. So we'll we'll talk about that when the time comes. Okay, sounds good. Uh, and then, uh, Zachary, I'll follow up about follow up your about piece you. and we have mm-hmm. Jeffrey, we have some open threads and Ed. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, I wanted to say one thing con- actually concretely just to go before we sign off Zachary on and Ed on not knowing what you were working on. I, I haven't really gotten to the point of operationalizing this really well yet, but I'm sort of setting the stage with some of the mind mapping around metapsychosis. But I would see that that would be the kind of thing, like the video you did and how that might turn into from a conversation into, uh, you know, something that gets, pub- that gets published. We have a channel, and you may not all have access to it yet, but it's called the E-Zone. And that's supposed mm-hmm. to be the editorial zone for metapsychosis, where ideas could get developed, kicked around, uh, editorial discussion could happen on pieces that are submitted. So I would suggest, and this is something, again, I, I, I need to bring forth this as a playbook kind of item, is that we look at that as a space where you could, it's not public in the sense that, you know, the general non-logged in, non-kind of, per, you know, permitted members can't see it. But it would be a place where if you have an, a seed of an idea and you'd like to get some feedback on it, you could put it out there uh, and uh, and then Ed would know about it. And if he's interested, he could chime in. And it, you know, if not, he'd just let it go. The other place is the creative studio. And that's another channel. The idea being that's more broadly about, you know, for cro- projects. That's where Doug started his discussion on, the, um, on uh, working with elders. Uh, and they're, they're similar, except the E-Zone is really oriented around publishing to metapsychosis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that would be a good place, you know, to pitch something uh, and see if anyone wants to pick it up. And what I would like to then have is for, you know, for us to have kind of two layers, one, one of more than two, you'll see it in the graph, but a sort of diffuse layer of community editors who don't have any particular responsibility necessarily to get anything done or publish anything on a particular schedule, but who are sort of there like Ed is to chime in on things that they find interesting and comment worthy. And then the more kind of staff editors who are getting, publishing things, uh, developing an editorial calendar, doing the website updates, etc. Uh, so, 
just a point that even without AI mm -hmm. filters, we have some mechanisms in place where we could be a little more transparent about who's working on what and where things are at. I think we can use tags to designate work steps in a workflow where something can go from a proposed state to, you know, in development, review, hey. And anyhow, this is the kind of thing, this is actually what I've been thinking mm. through and working on and trying to get out in, in some coherent form. Uh, and there will be more uh, of it to come. And I appreciate you all, uh, <laughs> um, you know, dealing with the sort of imperfect and, and uh, chaotic nature of some of the, some of the plants. Oh, I'm sorry. Are... I was on that's okay. That's still there. No, okay. that's Hi. Good. That's all right. So, I think we're done. We're done. What's her name? Her name's um, her name's actually Koan. Koan. K K O A N. Oh, I like the Zen Koan. Yeah, I like the Zen Koan. Yeah, we call her we call her Coco or Cozy. Mm hmm. And for the record, Marco's not your daddy. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm learning to do. Ah, uh, shiny things. They're kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. All righty. Okay. No, nope, not for me. Good. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Yeah, we're going to see chat tonight. Appreciate it. Great to connect. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. See you next time.